thanks again. What a pleasure and honor it is uh, to have the chance to share my enthusiasm for in situ microscopy. So what I'd like to do in this talk is uh, show some of the opportunities that we have now for understanding crystal growth processes, materials transformations, and using the mechanistic information that you can get from uh, electron microscopy to help create structures with useful properties. So I'm going to show work that was done by many people. Um, and the, these folks uh, worked with me in, in, uh, in MIT, where I am now, and IBM, where I worked previously, um, and uh, came from many different places. And I especially would like to acknowledge technical support. Um, so as you'll see from some of these, uh, these examples, the kind of thing that you need to do to the microscope, maybe modifications, sample design, whatever it is, this requires some uh, innovation and expertise. And really without our technical backup, uh, these kinds of things would not be possible at all. All right, so let's go for it. Um, in, um, in situ techniques are quite varied. Come on, let's go. <laughs> in situ techniques <laughs> are quite varied. And if we're thinking about problems of crystal growth and materials reactions, we can um, uh, imagine all kinds of interesting physics and applications where electron microscopy with its fabulous combination of spatial and temporal resolution combined with uh, compositional information, bonding information, uh, offers unique information. So here are some examples. Uh, this is a catalyst at work. This uh, region at the top that's moving around is a liquid gold silicon eutectic droplet. It sits on the top of a nanowire, a post of silicon. Um, and uh, if supplied by silicon, uh, by flowing a gas like disilane, uh, the, the, the gas uh, adsorbs on the surface and diffuses through the catalyst and adds onto the nanowire. And what you can see for this movie, which is recorded under reaction conditions, is that there's a solid uh, crystalline surface on the liquid droplet, completely unexpected, and um, only possible to see this kind of thing if you do the imaging under the conditions where the catalyst is doing its job, uh, cooling it down, removing the gas, these things will change the structure and make it impossible to figure out what was going on. So the um, ordered surface determines the catalytic properties of this droplet. So here's an example where you need to observe things as they happen to understand what's going on. Um, here's a second example where we've grown gold uh, triangles onto a graphene substrate and the weak bonding of the graphene surface, the van der Waals bonding, means that the gold islands are not very well attached. You can see them jiggling around. I know the movie's jiggling too, but do you see that one at the bottom just rotated? And this kind of, uh, of measurement allows us to say something about the strengths of the bonding between 3D materials like gold and 2D materials like graphene or, or um, other layered structures. Um, finally, I want to show you an example of a um, process of gas and liquid. So this is nucleation uh, growth and motion of bubbles filled with hydrogen within a water layer being imaged in a liquid cell in the electron microscope. Many processes depend on nucleation and growth of nanoscale bubbles in water like catalysis, uh, water splitting reactions, a uh, lot of energy storage. Uh, we need to, to control cavitation corrosion, uh, control where the, where the droplets, where the bubbles form and how they move. So this type of, uh, of process is very well uh, amenable to study using electron microscopy. And it's interesting to look at the different length scales of these movies. Uh, you don't always need atomic resolution. It's nice, the images are great, but sometimes even somewhat lower resolution coupled with the temporal resolution gives you the information that you want to study the problem that you'd like uh, to study. All right, so these um, resolution and properties of electron microscopy make it ideal for addressing a really important grand challenge in, elect in material science. So this grand challenge is to design and build materials that have specific useful properties. And those properties could be structural, uh, electronic, optical, whatever it might be. Uh, we often look, for, look to nanoscale science to provide new tools for achieving this goal, for designing new materials, because shrinking the size of a material often unlocks new properties. So how can we create controllable small volumes of material that can be used uh, to uh, change the properties compared to the bulk? So one 
One way, of course, is to move each atom into place. And this, uh, this uh, image is from uh, scanning tunneling microscopy work from some of my colleagues when I was at IBM. And they've made the world's smallest stable magnetic bit uh, out of 12 iron atoms moved into place using the tip of the STM. So this is fabulous stuff. Um, of course, it's not scalable for the real world, but really interesting to, to measure the physics of small assemblies of atoms. Instead of this type of top-down assembly of small structures, we really want to look at a more bottom-up type of process. Uh, the process of self-assembly, which is a spontaneous process that creates many nanostructures structures all at once. So here's an example where water droplets uh, uh, formed on the surface of one of the windows in our lab during a, a, a rain shower. And you obviously surface tension controls the shape of each thing, tries to make it into a hemisphere to minimize the surface area. But what you can see, the characteristics of this process is that it's, it's parallel, it's simple, um, it occurs if you set the conditions right, the material will naturally do the thing that you want it to do. But the difficulty is that these, these types of self-assembled structures tend to be fairly simple and they're obviously not particularly well controlled. So the question we ask ourselves is, can we use simple self-assembly uh, strategies to build complicated structures? And in order to control self-assembly at the nanoscale, we need to understand it. And that's where electron microscopy is going to help by allowing us to observe the physics that controls self-assembly processes. All right. So what I'd like to do now is show three examples of how this works. And the first uh, one, and they're going to follow basically the three movies I, I just showed you. We're going to talk about nanowire growth, a catalytic self-assembly process. We're going to talk about uh, liquid phase crystal growth. And then finally, we're going to talk about um, epitaxial growth, strain and, um, and uh, energy um, you know, controlled growth of one material in an aligned way onto a second uh, substrate. So let's start by looking at um, self-assembly of semiconductor nanowires. And this was a process that was first developed in the 60s and uh, often illustrated by what you might call PowerPoint science. And so you get a lot of this in nanoscience because things are too small to see. We draw a diagram of what we think is going on, but we don't necessarily have proof that that's truly what actually happens. So in this case, we really do. And here's the process that we're interested in studying. You start with a liquid droplet with catalytic properties, and the properties arise from the fact that it's liquid, it has a disordered surface with, with a high sticking probability. So we place this droplet onto a crystalline substrate like silicon. Um, we then uh, provide the growth material, silicon, in the form of a reactive gas. So this gas, chemical vapor deposition precursor gas, will land on the heated substrate, maybe at 400 degrees C. It will crack, the hydrogen goes away, the silicon is left behind, the silicon diffuses through the, the liquid droplet and deposits on the interface. And therefore growth takes place at the interface and only where the droplet is present. The reason that there isn't much growth out here is that the sticking probability of the gas molecule is very low at places that are not covered by this amorphous liquid droplet. All right, so this is great. So we have a process by which we can direct the addition of atoms uh, at certain locations on a substrate by placing catalytic droplets. So how does this PowerPoint science work in real life? So here's a movie of the, gro of the growth process taking place. Um, we have our gold silicon uh, eutectic droplet showing up as dark in this bright field image. We have the single crystal perfect silicon nanowire. It's a bright field image showing thickness fringes. So you can see the nanowire is thicker in the middle. It has a hexagonal cross section. And you can also see that it has interesting surface features. The, by the way, these tell you that we're not creating this movie just by sliding the field of view sideways. This is a real growth mo movie, speed it up a bit, but at 500 degrees C in a low pressure disilane. Um, so the material is clearly adding to the growth surface 
and the growth surface remains planar, and the result has no crystal defects, just a single crystal. So this is this is a, a, an interesting view of this process. Uh, how do we achieve this type of uh, view? We have to modify our microscope to some extent. We're dealing with reactive gases like uh, disilane, digermane, arsine, trimethyl gallium. These require uh, special handling. They are held in uh, small gas bottles that are mounted near the microscope. The microscope itself has to have an ultra high vacuum base pressure such that the sample can be cleaned and the growth can take place without the presence of oxygen water or other things that will confuse the, um, the, the process and result in artifacts. Uh, so then this means that we have to redesign the sample uh, uh, cartridge. We have to attach these side chambers that allow us to clean, insert and clean the sample, calibrate the temperature, and then put it in the microscope, heat it up, flow the gases. So these um, types of in-situ observations that you can make, uh, in general, this is a general statement here, they give quantitative clues. If you can calibrate the conditions well, you get real numbers out of these experiments, but they also show us surprising new phenomena, which is really one of the most fun things about doing these types of experiments. All right, so nanowires, we grow them outwards, they're growing epitaxially, the crystal structure is the same as shares the, the substrate uh, crystal structure, and they grow in the 111 direction. So if we cut a wafer with 111 going horizontally uh, and mount it in this way in the microscope, then as the electron beam comes down past the surface of the sample, the nanowires grow out and you get a really good view of the whole growth physics um, that it takes place. All right, good. So let's show the same process at higher resolution. We can, of course, measure the phase of the catalyst, the interface morphology, the way the growth takes place at the interface, the way defects form the surface structure, and we can calibrate the conditions to match with growth models. So if I show you that same movie as before, but at higher resolution, uh, you can start to see the really interesting dynamics that take place during uh, the growth of silicon nanowires. Do you see that this thing is kind of breathing? Like there's, there's a, a gap and then suddenly the addition of an entire sheet of silicon atoms. If we take the middle out of this uh, movie and we uh, blow it up, um, it's the same data just shown larger. You can see that nothing happens for a while and then nothing, and then nothing, and then, then, there. A whole layer adds all at once, right? That's pretty interesting. Um, if we grow gallium arsenide by flowing both arsine and trimethyl gallium, um, we get a somewhat different result. This is this time we're recording in dark field conditions. The catalytic droplet is less obvious, but the defects within the nanowire itself are, are much more obvious. And look at the, the step flow along the interface. Do you see that it's actually going back and forth slowly enough to track it as the nanowire grows? So layer by layer, nanowire growth is taking place um, at this uh, junction between the catalyst and the, and the, um, and the nanowire. So we can make very detailed uh, uh, observations, but what do we do with them next? Uh, we have to wonder about the physics that's going on as we grow these nanowires. Um, the, the first thing to notice is that silicon arrives at the catalyst surface at a steady rate from the gas phase, and it really has to ask the question, should it stay in solution or precipitate at the interface? Now, supposing the catalyst has a low solubility for the growth species, then pretty much any time silicon arrives, it has to precipitate at the interface. We get gradual step flow. This is the case for gallium arsenide growth, where the catalyst has low solubility for arsenic. Um, on the other hand, if the catalyst has a high solubility, then it, it, there's no energy penalty for the silicon just to, just to saturate the droplet. Although eventually, um, then, a step will nucleate, the, the, the saturation will become so high that it's worthwhile to nucleate a step. And at that point, there's enough silicon present to complete the step at once. We get a waiting time and then rapid step flow. So you can see that the observations you make in the microscope translate directly to an understanding of the physics that goes on within the catalyst. So that's interesting fundamentally. It helps us choose a catalyst for specific behaviors, but it also has a strong 
um, effect on the on the eventual structure of the nanowire. This is because typically you're not interested so much in a single component nanowire, that's fine, but there's other ways to make it. Instead, uh, we really want to study <coughs> or make use of, uh, of nanowires that have a, um, a heterojunction. So we grow one material, we switch off that one material, we add a second growth material, we get a beautiful stripe, and then we maybe we go back to the first one. And so obviously, in the case of a catalyst that has a large reservoir of the growth material, you're not going to get a very sharp junction, and so you won't get really good electronic properties. So creating useful electronic properties means that we need to control the interfaces, and therefore we have to uh, choose the growth physics of the catalyst to uh, achieve those interfaces. Now, um, you might think that uh, having grown a sharp interface between, say, materials like silicon and germanium, we'd like to try it with other materials. And so I'm going to show you an example that illustrates how unexpected and interesting it can be when you start to set up an in-situ experiment. So we thought, OK, we've grown germanium on silicon. Let's now grow a metal like uh, nickel disilicide onto silicon to make a contact, an electrical contact that would make the wire useful within uh, a device like a, like a transistor. So let's keep flowing silicon, but add some nickel. So this is how we did the experiment. We started to grow a nanowire, we stopped growth, we added nickel onto the surface, and then we continue to flow some silicon, expecting to get a layer of nickel disilicide forming at the interface. But no, the nickel disilicide formed as a little structure within the droplet, floated around a bit, stuck down, and eventually the nanowire continued to grow around it. So this type of process <clears throat> where a new phase forms within the liquid phase, or maybe at the the uh, surface gives you an opportunity to grow really interesting structures like a quantum dot embedded within a nanowire, but mostly uh, shows that you can never guess what's going to happen. There's always some way that it will surprise you when you do these experiments. All right, now the last thing I'll say about nanowires, I don't want to give the impression that everything works first time, that you can always get some results, because most of the time it fails for some reason. Uh, for example, if the vacuum in the microscope isn't clean and you get junk, uh, silicon dioxide caused by the uh, disilane reacting with oxygen in the, in the background. So this will completely cut off the growth process. The vacuum is important. You can get irregular growth, you can get kinking, which actually is pretty interesting. <clears throat> but uh, you can also see changes in the uh, catalytic droplet size, which result in the death of the nanowires. And you might think that this would be um, <clears throat> excuse me, would, would be an unfavorable situation. Here we have Ostwald ripening. This gold is diffusing away down the length of the nanowire and up to the uh, droplet in the neighboring nanowires. But this actually gives us a lot of information about the surface mobility of the species and the, physic, the physical phenomena that control growth. So this one turned out to be one of our most, uh, uh, I, I would say, productive failures of growth uh, during these experiments. All right. So uh, we've talked a lot about um, growing self-assembled structures by making strategic use of catalysts. Uh, and so this is all a gas phase uh, reaction. We supply the material from the gas phase. It, it lands on the surface, it diffuses around, it incorporates, and the growth takes place. So it naturally opens a question, uh, how do crystal growth processes play out when the medium is not vacuum, but some liquid? And these types of processes are extremely important in especially, say, electrochemical nucleation and growth, where we drive the formation of, uh, of material uh, in different forms by uh, applying a voltage and supplying ions in a, from an electrolyte, or alternatively, uh, liquid phase crystal growth where uh, temperature or irradiation drives the formation of nanocrystals in solution. So how do we look at liquids in the microscope? Well, um, the initial concept of embedding uh, of sorry surrounding a liquid by two 
windows really was developed right from the beginning of the electron microscopy era. And you can see descriptions of this type of, um, of experiment way back uh, in, the, in, the, in the 40s and onwards. But uh, really, uh, most recent uh, microfabrication techniques really allow us to make this work in a practical sense. We can place a liquid, uh, maybe a few hundred nanometers or a few tens of nanometers thick in between two electron transparent windows, typically silicon nitrogen tried, although other materials are possible, like uh, 2D materials. And then we can include things like electrodes, uh, heating, uh, flow of the liquid, some way of handling changes of liquid or mixing liquids. And these are all possible, allowing us to view a liquid in its uh, liquid state in between two windows without it evaporating into the microscope uh, vacuum. So for electrochemical nucleation and growth of materials, we want to have um, electrodes in plane and then we can look down on the surface of the electrodes as growth takes place there, or we can look around the edges as growth takes place laterally. So let's see how that worked, uh, starting from the earliest ones, which were glued by hand. Uh, with you see the, the electrode here and another one that comes out here. So very low success rate, uh, and you had to not drink too much coffee when doing these experiments. Um, and now we have these very sophisticated systems, wafer bonded systems and, and uh, chip systems where the, the sample holder itself clamps the two chips together to enclose the liquid. All right, so what can we do with these kinds of experiments? Again, looking at a self-assembly process, we're depositing, we're gonna deposit copper on gold um, by applying a voltage uh, in between electrodes in a copper sulfate uh, sulfuric acid solution. So this is what happens when you do the experiment. And here's the fascinating thing. Um, you can see the nucleation and growth of copper ions, but simultaneously, you can see the current that flows through the complete circuit as a function of time. And you can map the current, uh, the time, and the voltage that you applied to make this process work uh, under different conditions. Here's a few examples here. And then you can measure the size and density and estimate the volume of the islands. Um, we know how many copper ions were were um, were reduced to copper to create the islands in the in the movie, and simultaneously we know how much current flowed, so we can correlate these two things. So electrochemists typically only have the um, the graph, the graphical data, the current voltage and time, and they do a fabulous amount with it. But the fact that you can also see the movie, even though it's not high resolution, it gives you a tremendous amount of information. And so if we take the, the, the information from the movie and compare with the, with the uh, electrochemical parameters, we find a discrepancy between them that uh, means that they don't fit the conventional uh, standard models of nucleation and diffusion limited growth. Instead, we have to um, imply that a, a second process is taking place in parallel in the early stages that changes the the nucleation density uh, of the first nuclei that form during this process. Now, once you've grown copper onto the electrode, let's ask ourselves what happens as it starts to go outwards off the edge of the electrode. And now we're gonna go at a much higher deposition rate. And you'll see in this movie that there's a substantial amount of growth within just a few seconds. So this is uh, speeded up a little, but basically the whole process is finished in a few seconds. And you can see that the growth front initially straight evolves into this sort of dendritic, very rough surface and this is extremely well known in electrochemistry. Whenever you drive the system too fast, um, the diffusion of ions from uh, the solution onto the growing surface cannot keep up with the growth rate that you impose. And so growth takes place preferentially at the tips of the any asperities that have formed, and there's an instability that results in a very rough surface. And so this onset of instability is highly relevant to, for example, battery cycling, where uh, you can imagine it's a little bit harder to make a, a, a rechargeable battery if the morphology is this crazy every time you do a charge and discharge cycle. All right, so what can we do about that? Um, we can uh, firstly, as before, try to uh, match this with established models. Um, we do in fact find that uh, some of the established models work pretty well for the early growth and the later growth regimes at both high and, slow and low 
growth rates, but the transition time between these regimes doesn't follow expectations. And again, some other process, parallel process, lateral diffusion, most likely is, is probably responsible for this. So one interesting consequence of this understanding of the physics of uh, electrochemical deposition is that when you get a dendrite, it doesn't mean that there was an initial rough spot on the uh, on the surface. The dendrites grow from bumps that are formed spontaneously by kinetic roughening. So you can't suppress dendrites by having a super flat initial surface. We have to think of some other strategies for suppressing dendrites. One of them is to grow very slowly and to wait, grow a little and wait, grow a little and wait. And the reason is that uh, the reason this works is that the um, diffusion can then catch up with the growth. Uh, and so the, the ions can, <laughs> can, uh, can equilibrate and you get much less instability. A second strategy that started a little soon, the movie started too soon, was to do pulse reverse plating. You grow a little bit, you strip off the, a little, you grow a bit more, you take two steps forwards and one step back. Uh, the idea is that the reverse part of the cycle should knock off the asperities in the experiment and, re and replace the flat surface. But you can see in this particular movie that under the conditions we have here for pulse reverse plating, uh, it actually makes it worse. The smaller bumps are getting uh, dissolved preferentially, and the bigger ones are growing. We have classic kind of Oswald ripening process that's actually highly relevant to the performance of catalysts, um, electrocatalysts under cycling conditions, whereby the, the total surface area gets reduced as the smaller ones are um, eliminated. So more work is clearly needed, but the is that the ability to observe the process is giving us insights into what's going on that would be pretty much impossible to achieve without this visual uh, uh, view of, of, the, of the whole process. So of course there are many other things you can do with it with liquid cell electron microscopy that help us to understand crystal growth processes. This is an etching process where we strip away one component of a bimetallic catalyst or we're removing the nickel to, um, to uh, leave behind the platinum skeleton. And I put this slide up to show that it's possible to do experiments under different temperatures, uh, including electrochemical biasing and see how the temperature affects the different processes that uh, take place in particular here, the chemical etching and the electrochemical removal of the nickel, all right. So uh, liquid cell electron microscopy has many challenges. Again, I don't want to give the impression that it's uh, entirely straightforward. One of the worst, or let's say not worst, but something you always have to worry about is um, the effect of the electron beam. Uh, radiolysis of water by the energetic beam produces very uh, highly reactive species. Um, these all are created, uh, destroyed and diffuse around, and these can change the experiment. Um, so since these growth rates, since the dose rates in a typical imaging conditions greatly exceed anything that's known outside, even at the walls of a nuclear reactor, um, you have to do some extrapolation to figure out what's going on. But uh, we can at least do that and get some understanding of what the effects of the radiolysis will be on the experiments. So um, you can, of course, uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount of development going on in the general field now of uh, microscopy, electron microscopy for liquids. And I just want to show one last example, which is an improvement of the resolution uh, compared to those early movies I showed for copper plating. So it's the exact same process that I showed before, copper deposition from acidified copper sulfate solution. And you can see the self-assembly of these beautiful faceted crystals much more clearly now that we're using a graphene electrode uh, with much less scattering compared to the gold electrode used previously. So um, you can uh, use modern equipment, you can modify the cell design, you can uh, take care with the dose to maximize the information uh, for a low dose. And so um, electron microscopy of liquids is a, is a huge area that I think is really exciting for understanding crystal growth physics. All right, good. So the last topic I want to talk about is the use of epitaxy to create self-assembled structures that can be quite complex and have interesting 
um, uh, electronic or optical properties. So this is, uh, I'm going to firstly show you a movie that was recorded a long time ago, uh, last century, uh, where we're depositing germanium on silicon. So it's a similar experiment to the nanowire growth in terms of the setup, in that we, except here, we start with a flat silicon sample, a transparent and flat surface, and we heat it up to maybe, uh, this was about uh, 650 degrees C, and then we flow um, germanium in a reactive gas dye germane, uh, which just like uh, the previous, the, the, the original example, the dye germane gas lands on the surface, it cracks, the hydrogen goes away, and the germanium is left behind and can then decide what it wants to do. Now, as you know, germanium uh, is a somewhat larger atom than silicon. So germanium has the same structure as silicon, but with 4% larger distance between the atoms. So the first few germanium atoms are going to arrange themselves on top of the silicon in an aligned way. They're going to grow epitaxially. But as we grow more and more germanium, the strain that, that is caused by forcing the lattices to align um, becomes very high. And the system looks for a way to relieve the strain. And this movie shows what it, what it does. Right, go for it. Um, as we look down on the surface, um, you can see the formation of strained islands, and you can also see a Ostwald ripening. See how the small ones are disappearing and the big ones are growing. So we have classical strain contrast imaging at low resolution, showing this unexpected inf Im information that even though we're supplying germanium during the growth experiment, there's still so much lateral diffusion that it's possible for an island to lose its material to the neighboring islands if those neighboring islands are larger. So the system relieves the strain by forming islands. The islands have, a, of course, a, 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 a height to them and the atoms at the top of the islands are less strained than the ones stuck at the substrate. But uh, in addition to forming islands, the islands undergo coarsening during growth that changes their size distribution. And so we can develop a growth model from these kinds of observations to help us understand evolution and devise the conditions that will optimize the uniformity of these self-assembled islands, for example, by patterning the surface um, to create regular uh, regular islands or quantum dots. So now this was this was a little while back. Uh, in the modern world, we don't just grow germanium on silicon. Uh, instead, we tend to grow um, very exotic materials on other exotic materials. And so for, as, a, as, a, as a very important example, uh, there's a lot of attention being paid to controlling the properties of 2D materials, layered materials, by stacking them up between other layered materials or by interfacing them with the outside world, with, uh, with gold um, islands, for example, for, for um, uh, catalytic or optical properties, or with uh, particular metal contacts for making electronic devices. So we need to control and, uh, and modulate the uh, process of growth of 3D materials onto 2D materials. And electron microscopy, uh, adapting the techniques from previously, can help us to do that. So here's an example uh, where we've grown um, gold on MOS2. This is my favorite pair of materials for this, uh, for this particular application because they give such beautiful images. So you can see in this, uh, in this uh, image, the MOS2 lattice structure is just about visible in the background. The gold structure on top isn't visible in itself, but there's a, a fabulous moiré pattern between the gold lattice and the MOS2 lattice. You can see in a cross section uh, that the lattice parameters are quite different. And this is the resulting moiré pattern. The regularity of this pattern tells us that the gold is epitaxially arranged on the MOS2. Um, the shape of the islands, the faceted islands, tells us about the energetics of different facets. And you can see even at room temperature imaging, um, there's a little bit of a rotation. Do you see that here in the islands? Just caused by the electron beam. Again, they're very poorly bonded, weakly bonded onto the substrate, just like those gold triangles on graphene that I showed you right at the beginning of this talk. 
Okay, so what, what will we do with this stuff? Um, we can, using the UHV properties of our microscope, grow many different types of metals on different 2D substrates. Uh, seeing epitaxy, even in surprising uh, conditions, this is niobium on um, graphene, showing really excellent epitaxy when the deposition temperature is high. And we can even see uh, substrate effects that don't take place in conventional epitaxy. This is titanium on graphene, and you can see from the type of contrast we get from the islands that if you grow um, titanium on thin graphene, you get curved islands. These are bent contours. Um, if you grow titanium on thick graphene, you get epitaxial islands with dislocations, and the difference is due to the, to the compliance, the curvature that's allowed in the substrate in these uh, types of samples, where the substrate is, is, a, is a membrane of 2D material suspended over a, like a hole in a silicon nitride uh, uh, sub, uh, you know, uh, mounting <laughs> support, let's say. Okay, so we can also grow different types of dimensionality. So these are nanowires of niobium trisulfide, these little lines that spontaneously form uh, when we deposit on an exotic 2D material. This is a 2D magnet, chromium sulfur bromide. And this epitaxy, very impressive epitaxy, is possible for some reason uh, because of the, uh, we, we're not fully uh, sure of what's going on here, but the, the alignment of the lattices of these two very different materials results in a high degree of epitaxy. I want to show you this just to illustrate the amazing structure within each nanowire. So the nanowires grow spontaneously. They don't need a catalyst, although it does help. And along the, the length of the nanowires are these chains of niobium and sulfur that give the material its interesting charge density wave properties. All right, so enough of that. Um, there's a lot of good physics you can get from these experiments. Um, we can understand the shape of the islands by firstly demonstrating that they are in thermal, that they are therm in thermodynamic equilibrium by doing heating experiments. And then by measuring the cross section and the height of the islands, we put this information in to the winter bottom construction that predicts the shape of islands on a substrate. And we can use that to measure the interface energy between the 3D and the 2D material, right? So a theme of the work I've shown is to try and we strive for complex self-assembled structures. And this works for these 3D on 2D um, self-assembled structures as well. Here's an example where we firstly grow titanium and then grow gold on top of it. And if we do this all in a clean environment in ultra high vacuum, the gold grows epitaxially on the titanium and it also grows epitaxially around the edge of the titanium. And you can, um, you can imagine that <clears throat> the gold on top is the, <coughs> the gold that was deposited directly on top of the islands and the stuff around it landed somewhere else on the graphene and then diffused up to the, up to the growing structure and formed a rim. And this is a very stable structure. It, it maintains its integrity even at quite high temperatures and so could be useful for uh, electronic contacts in devices. Um, if you expose the tie to oxygen, before depositing the gold, you get a rather different morphology with no epitaxy on top of the titanium and the same um, alignment around the outside. All right, so that's just kind of fun. And you can do variations on the theme. Here's, here's one where we're depositing on the top and bottom of the 2D material to create a structure that has potentially useful properties, for example, in, in, uh, in, in Josephson junctions, you can imagine this type of structure, right? And the last example I'll show is using one material to catalyze the growth of another one. So we're circling all the way back to nanowires, except this time we're taking a catalyst that sits on top of a substrate, and then we're using that to grow a third material, which if you grew it without the catalyst would not have a good epitaxial relationship with the, with the 2D uh, surface. So we end up with three different materials that are all precisely aligned with respect to each other and the position and to some extent the shape of the results can be controlled um, even though this is a self-assembly process. So I think um, 
I think that's all I'd like to say in terms of showing you examples. I'd like to conclude by saying that I see this as a very exciting time for um, microscopy and for nano science and nanotechnology, because at this moment we have developments in, in microscopy that are absolutely amazing. Um, and we can apply those new types of microscopy to accelerate the progress that is going on at the moment in the discovery, use and integration of new materials. So we have the need to make ever more complicated structures, uh, even down to ones that contain single atoms. Um, we need to create these in a precise and controlled way, uh, but we also want to grow them using simple, scalable growth processes like self-assembly. So this grand challenge uh, can start to be addressed by the developments in imaging tools where we take microscopy with controlled vacuum, with liquid uh, environment um, and controlled uh, conditions of temperature, uh, voltage, current, whatever, um, and we combine this with advances in aberration correction, low voltage operation, and new detectors that make the microscope itself much more usable, um, with precision in steering the beam, uh, in machine learning to analyze what you have on the fly and speed up the whole experiment, uh, using this for materials modification, as in uh, the example I'm showing here. Uh, uh, we've got MEMS technology for improving this, the sample and the sample holder design. And we have um, advances in uh, the manufacturer's interest in ultra high vacuum um, for improving the control of the experiment. So although quantification remains a challenge, I think we're in a great spot for these experiments. And um, I hope that uh, this can encourage uh, some of the audience there maybe to get involved in these types of experiments. All right, so I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks very much for your attention.